This is section 55 of Mark Twain's Speeches by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Spelling and Pictures by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Address at the annual dinner of the Associated Press at the Waldorf Astoria, September 18, 1906. I am here to make an appeal to the nations in behalf of the simplified spelling. I have come here because they cannot all be reached except through you. There are only two forces that can carry light to all the corners of the globe, only two, the sun in the heavens and the associated press down here. I may seem to be flattering the sun, but I do not mean it so. I am meaning only to be just and fair all around. You speak with a million voices. No one can reach so many races, so many hearts and intellects as you, except Rudyard Kipling, and he cannot do it without your help. If the Associated Press will adopt and use our simplified forms and thus spread them to the ends of the earth, covering the whole spacious planet with them as with a garden of flowers, our difficulties are at an end. Every day of the 365, the only pages of the world's countless newspapers that are read by all the human beings and angels and devils that can read, are these pages that are built out of Associated Press despatches. And so I beg you, I beseech you, oh, I implore you to spell them in our simplified forms. Do this daily, constantly, persistently, for three months, only three months, it is all I ask. The infallible result? Victory. Victory all down the line. For by that time all eyes here and above and below will have become adjusted to the change and in love with it, and the present clumsy and ragged forms will be grotesque to the eye and revolting to the soul, and we shall be rid of tisis and tisic and pneumonia and pneumatics and diphtheria and pterodactyl and all those other insane words which no man addicted to the simple Christian life can try to spell and not lose some of the bloom of his piety in the demoralizing attempt. Do not doubt it, we are chameleons, and our partialities and prejudices change places with an easy and blessed facility, and we are soon wanted to the change and happy in it. We do not regret our old yellow fangs and snags and tushes after we have worn nice fresh uniform store teeth a while. Do I seem to be seeking the good of the world? That is the idea. It is my public attitude. Privately, I am merely seeking my own profit. We all do it, but it is sound, and it is virtuous, for no public interest is anything other or nobler than a massed accumulation of private interests. In 1883, when the simplified spelling movement first tried to make a noise, I was indifferent to it. More, I even irreverently scoffed at it. What I needed was an object lesson, you see. It is the only way to teach some people. Very well, I got it. At that time I was scrambling along, earning the family's bread on magazine work at seven cents a word, compound words at single rates, just as it is in the dark present. I was the property of a magazine, a seven-cent slave, under a boiler-iron contract. One day there came a note from the editor requiring me to write ten pages on this revolting text. Considerations concerning the alleged subterranean holophotal extemporaneousness of the conciliaceous superimbrication of the ornithorhynchus, as foreshadowed by the unintelligibility of its plesiosaurian anisodactylous aspects. Ten pages of that. Each and every word 
a seventeen-jointed, vestibuled railroad train. Seven cents a word. I saw starvation staring the family in the face. I went to the editor, and I took a stenographer along so as to have the interview down in black and white, for no magazine editor can ever remember any part of a business talk except the part that's got graft in it for him and the magazine. I said, read that text, Jackson, and let it go on the record. Read it out loud. He read it, Considerations concerning the alleged subterranean holophotal extemporaneousness of the conchalaceous superimbrication of the ornithorhynchus, as foreshadowed by the unintelligibility of its plesiosaurian anisodactylus aspects. I said, You want ten pages of those rumbling great long summer thunder peals, and you expect to get them at seven cents a peal? He said, A word's a word, and seven cents is the contract. What are you going to do about it? I said, Jackson, this is cold-blooded oppression. What's an average English word? He said, Six letters. I said, Nothing of the kind. That's French, and includes the spaces between the words. An average English word is four letters and a half. By hard, honest labor, I've dug all the large words out of my vocabulary and shaved it down till the average is three letters and a half. I can put one thousand and two hundred words on your page, and there's not another man alive that can come within two hundred of it. My page is worth eighty-four dollars to me. It takes exactly as long to fill your magazine page with long words as it does with short ones four hours. Now then, look at the criminal injustice of this requirement of yours. I am careful. I am economical of my time and labor. For the family's sake, I've got to be so. So I never write metropolis for seven cents, because I can get the same money for city. I never write policeman, because I can get the same price for cop, and so on and so on. I never write valetudinarian at all, for not even hunger and wretchedness can humble me to the point where I will do a word like that for seven cents. I wouldn't do it for fifteen. Examine your obscene text, please. Count the words. He counted and said it was twenty-four. I asked him to count the letters. He made it two hundred and three. I said, Now I hope you see the whole size of your crime. With my vocabulary I would make sixty words out of those two hundred and five letters, and get four dollars and twenty cents for it, whereas for your inhuman twenty-four I would get only one dollar and sixty-eight cents. Ten pages of these skyscrapers of yours would pay me only about three hundred dollars. In my simplified vocabulary the same space and the same labor would pay me eight hundred and forty dollars. I do not wish to work upon this scandalous job by the piece. I want to be hired by the year. He coldly refused. I said, Then, for the sake of the family, if you have no feeling for me, you ought at least to allow me overtime on that word extemporaneousness. Again he coldly refused. I seldom say a harsh word to anyone, but I was not master of myself then, and I spoke right out, and called him an anisodactylus plesiosaurian conchalaceous ornithorhynchus, and rotten to the heart with holiophotal subterraneous extemporaneousness. God forbid me for that wanton crime. He lived only two hours. From that day to this— I have been a devoted and hard-working member of the heaven-born institution, the International Association for the Prevention of Cruelty to Authors, and now I am laboring with Carnegie's Simplified Committee and with my heart in the work. Now then, let us look at this mighty question reasonably, rationally, sanely, yes, and calmly, not excitedly. What is the real function, the essential function, the supreme function of language? 
isn't it merely to convey ideas and emotions certainly then if we can do it with words of phonetic brevity and compactness why keep the present cumbersome forms but can we yes i hold in my hand the proof of it here is a letter written by a woman right out of her heart of hearts i think she never saw a spelling book in her life the spelling is her own there isn't a waste letter in it anywhere it reduces the phonetics to the last gasp it squeezes the surplusage out of every word there's no spelling that can begin with it on this planet outside of the white house and as for the punctuation there isn't any it is all one sentence eagerly and breathlessly uttered without break or pause in it anywhere the letter is absolutely genuine i have the proofs of that in my possession i can't stop to spell the words for you but you can take the letter presently and comfort your eyes with it i will read the letter miss dear friend i took some close into the armory and give them to you to send to the sufferers out to california and i hate to treble you but i got to have one of them back it was a black old wool cheviot with a jacket to match trimmed kind of fancy no thirty-eight burst measure and palsy mentary across the front and the color i wouldn't trouble you but it belonged to my brother's wife and she is mad about it i thought she was willing but she wants she says she want done with it and she was going to wear it a spell longer she ain't so free-hearted as what i am and she has got more to do with than i have having a husband to work and slave for her i gals you remember me i'm shot and stout and light-complected i talked with you quite a spell about the sufferers and said it was awful about that earthquake i shouldn't wander if they had another one right off seeing general condition of the country is kind of explosive i hate to take that black dress away from the sufferers but i will hunt round and see if i can get another one if i can i will call to the armory for it if you will just lay it aside so no more that present from your true friend i liked your appearance very much now you see what simplified spelling can do it can convey any fact you need to convey and it can pour out emotions like a sewer i beg you i beseech you to adopt our spelling and print all your dispatches in it now i wish to say just one entirely serious word i have reached a time of life seventy years and a half where none of the concerns of this world have much interest for me personally i think i can speak dispassionately upon this matter because in the little while that i have got to remain here i can get along very well with these old-fashioned forms and i don't propose to make any trouble about it at all i shall soon be where they won't care how i spell so long as i keep the sabbath there are eighty-two millions of us people that use this orthography and it ought to be simplified in our behalf but it is kept in its present condition to satisfy one million people who like to have their literature in the old form that looks to me rather selfish and we keep the forms as they are while we have got one million people coming in here from foreign countries every year and they have got to struggle with this orthography of ours and it keeps them back and damages their citizenship for years until they learn to spell the language if they ever do learn this is merely sentimental argument people say it is the spelling of chaucer and spencer and shakespeare and a lot of other people who do not know how to spell anyway and it has been transmitted to us and we preserved it and wish to preserve it because of its ancient and hallowed associations now i don't see that there is any real argument about that if that argument is good then it would be a good argument not to banish the flies and the cockroaches from hospitals 
because they have been there so long that the patients have got used to them and they feel a tenderness for them on account of the associations why it is like preserving a cancer in a family because it is a family cancer and we are bound to it by the test of affection and reverence and old moldy antiquity i think that this declaration to improve this orthography of ours is our family cancer and i wish we could reconcile ourselves to have it cut out and let the family cancer go now you see before you the wreck and ruin of what was once a young person like yourselves i am exhausted by the heat of the day i must take what is left of this wreck and run out of your presence and carry it away to my home and spread it out there and sleep the sleep of the righteous there is nothing much left of me but my age and my righteousness but i leave with you my love and my blessing and may you always keep your youth End of Spelling and Pictures by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman